Hello, everybody. This is Edgar Winter, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Rock and roll. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil and spun. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... The legendary Edgar Winter. Yes, promoting uh, his 2022 release, Brother Johnny. What a great album. Fantastic. Uh, dedicated to it, Johnny yeah, Winter. Brother's uh, favorite songs and uh, covers and stuff like that that he enjoyed. Yeah, and he's also uh, getting ready to hit the road with Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band, right? Yeah, and as uh, this one i got to take a little minute to just kind of sit back because as a 14-year-old kid, that's one of the first <laughs> albums that my uncle gave me to listen to was the Edgar Winter Group. Yeah, i got to tell you. I had to pinch myself when we did this interview. Yeah. Let's get to it, man. All right. Good night. Good night. Uh, Edgar, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Edgar, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, are you all ready to rock and roll? Yeah. We absolutely are. Uh, you have a great press. We uh, you have a great publicist, press person. Um, we're so excited to have you on tonight. So let's get this started. Um, and, uh, Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So in uh, April of uh, 2022, you released uh, the Brother Johnny album, a tribute to your uh, brother, Johnny Winter. Can you talk a little bit more about the creative process for this album? Well, certainly. Uh, there are many, there seems to be a sense of destiny, of fate, about this entire album, and uh, a number of ironies uh, connected with it as well. But uh, I was originally uh, against doing a tribute album. There are three people that I want to thank. First of all, my beautiful wife, Monique, <laughs> to whom I've been happily and blissfully married for 44 years now. Nice. We just had our 44th anniversary. And it was she who really convinced me uh, to do the record. And uh, what lay behind that was the fact that Johnny passed away une unexpectedly yeah. in uh, around 2014. Mm -hmm. And we were scheduled to do a tour together called the Rock Blues Fest. And uh, I was really looking forward to that. And uh, it was just such a shock. And, and shortly thereafter, I started to get... Uh, there, there was a lot of interest in a tribute album. And I was approached. I did a few meetings with record companies. And they would ask questions like... Uh, how long will it take? How much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. And what uh, guest artists can you guarantee? And it, it became apparent to me that these were 
more just business people sensing an opportunity and, uh, you know, uh, just to, you know, to, uh, just to sell some records, uh, Mm -hmm. using Johnny's name and memory. And that wasn't something that I really wanted to be a part of. Plus I just was emotionally devastated and, and there was no way I could do, uh, that kind of record at that time. But as years went by, I became increasing, increasingly aware that it, that this wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just, uh, business people, but Johnny's true, loyal, devoted fans that wanted to see this happen. And then when I, when I talked to my wife Monique about it, she was just very definite. She said, well, you always talk about how Johnny is your all-time musical hero and you wouldn't be where you are today Mm -hmm. were it not for him. Well, here's your opportunity to acknowledge and demonstrate that. You really owe it to yourself, uh, to Johnny, to his fans, to the world, you know, to do this record. And she was absolutely right in every respect. Uh, And then once I got the idea into my head... I really became obsessed with, and, you know, I had thought, oh, this is really going to be emotionally difficult. Uh, Doing all of these old songs is going to stir up a a lot of early uh, childhood memories. Uh, You know, this really, this is the music Johnny and I grew up playing together uh, and certainly was... uh, was a soundtrack for a lot of our lives, uh, and you know, it's it's classic rock, and and I think, you know, we all are tempted to feel like the time in which we came up was somehow special, but I really do believe there were two golden eras in music: the 40s and 50s for big band jazz and mm-hmm. swing, and the 60s and 70s for uh, for rock. Yeah. And to me, they're they're really unparalleled, and. Uh, this album is it's like a 70s record it has a very live feel uh but you know i i really want to i always think monique if it weren't for her i just wouldn't have had the courage uh and tenacity that it took like i thought it might take a year i knew it would be uh i knew it would be a real undertaking uh but then with the onset of COVID, it ended up taking like three years. So anyway, when I decided to do the album, I called up my good friend, uh, Ross Hogarth. And uh, he had worked with me on my last record, uh, Rebel Road. And uh, he and I really made this record together. And I originally enlisted his help. I just wanted him to engineer uh, not to engineer, but to mix the record. Mm-hmm. He sort of saved my record before, prior to that. He came into the end of that project and mixed it. And uh, it was just so great. As soon as I heard his mixes, I said, I'm not going to work with anybody else other than Ross for the rest of my life. He's, he is the guy. And uh, he just uh, had followed. He is, uh, is practically as big a fan of Johnny's music as 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 I am, and had followed Johnny's, knew all of his albums, all of his songs. And when I asked him, he said, oh, I, I have to do this. I, You know, this would mean so much to me. And his brother had just passed away also. Uh, and when I called him, he, I think he was in New York or somewhere, and he said, oh, absolutely. And uh, Ross, uh, rather than... He said, well, if I'm going to mix it, I'd prefer to engineer it, which he did. So he engineered and mixed and really became the co-creator of the album. He had so many uh, amazing suggestions for people that I just wouldn't uh, either were not familiar with or wouldn't have thought of, like uh, Doyle Bramhall Jr., mm. uh, he, who uh, I knew of as, as playing with Eric Clapton, being Eric's second guitarist. But uh, I didn't know that he played such great acoustic, uh, you know, traditional acoustic guitar. That was one of Johnny's strengths. There, there are a lot of great electric blues players, but Johnny, uh, when it, when it, I think that was the thing that set him apart. From he really 
the authenticity of, of his slide, his acoustic slide playing, was was really amazing. And then uh, 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 Phil Axe, who plays with uh, Bon Jovi, yes. was another one of his suggestions. Uh, uh, and uh, John McPhee, who mm-hmm. I, I didn't think of him as a slide player either, but when I remembered some of the early Doobie Brothers uh you know, tracks were so great. So I, I just couldn't have done this record. It wouldn't be the record it is without Roth. And the third person being uh, Bruce Cordo of Cordo Valley Records. Yes. Uh, and I, uh, when I met Bruce, that was what definitely decided me to do the record because he wanted to do it for all the right reasons. He said, Edgar, it's, it's up to you. Take as long as you need uh, and do it anywhere anyway uh the guest uh, all of that all the whole the whole creative uh aspect of it is uh entirely up to you and so uh you know we started work on it and <laughs> and it really for me it's just it's all about love my you know love of uh of music first of all and and the brotherhood between Johnny and myself uh, uh, I, and I did it for my wife, Monique, for our family, really. My mom and dad, I know, would have loved, you know, this, yeah. you know, this album mm-hmm. uh, coming out. And, of course, for all the fans that have followed my career as well as that of Johnny's throughout all the years. And then it, it, just, it just took on a, an amazing life of its own. And uh, it was very cathartic, cleansing, I, I had thought it would that it might be difficult emotionally and sad, but it turned out to be just the most uplifting, joyous experience. And I got to meet a lot of people that that I had never had an opportunity to work or play with. It's just, it, I, as I said, there was a sense of destiny and fate about it, and just so much love. I've I've done a lot of albums throughout my career. But I've never seen as much passion and just pure love and caring go into the making of a record. So there you go. Well yeah, said. That's thank, awesome. thank you. Well, I think I read was were there three studios involved in the making of this album? How did, how did it work? Did, were you, did since COVID was going, did you, did people have to mail in their tracks, or how did it work? Yeah, uh, we started it at Capitol. The, you know the great the the great room at Capitol. And that that meant so much to me. There, yeah. There's this little uh, there's this little place up there called the Crow's Nest where uh, Nat King Cole used to uh, reputedly do his vocals oh, up nice. there, like looking down on the studio with you know whatever band you know happened to be and i said wow i can't believe i'm right i'm I'm singing right here in the very spot that nat king cole did some of those you know uh, those just amazing classical vocals and then uh the there was there were another couple of studios but that was all uh that was all overdubbing and tracking so i really uh i started the album at home in my own little Winterland, I refer yeah. to it as, which I've uh, been probably been referring to Winterland long before Bill Graham uh, started <laughs> using it. But uh, you know, I did the original piano parts there, and uh, and then uh, the drummer Greg Bissonette, who I decided I wanted to do the entire album, and Greg and I have played together. Uh, well, we're playing together now with Ringo and his all-star band, and he played on a jazz record that I did some years ago called Jazz in the Blues. And he's just like the greatest, most versatile drummer. Uh, uh, he's world-class. You know, you know, he he played with David Lee Roth, and then, you know, he uh, is a uh, North Texas graduate so he played with all those great lab bands like mm-hmm. the one o'clock uh he's a great jazz player he can basically play anything and he really became the heartbeat and the like the the feel 
uh, established the feel for the whole album. And uh, in, the, in the beginning, it was just he and I, the piano tracks and drums, and then uh, uh, Sean Hurley, who uh, he was one of the bassists, and Bob Glob. Uh, Sean uh, played, uh, was playing with John Mayer at the time, and uh, uh, that was basically the rhythm section. And then I'm sure you, you guys probably uh, want me to read some of the uh, some of the guests. Uh, Absolutely. Just to give people an idea of uh, some of the amazing guitarists, uh, Joe Bonamassa, yeah. Joe Walsh, of course, originally with the James Gang and uh, the Eagles, Billy Gibbons, uh, ZZ Top, uh, Derek Trucks, uh, mm-hmm. tr- uh, Tedeschi Trucks, and Warren Haynes uh, from Government Mule. But Derek Trucks and Warren Haynes both played with the Allman Brothers. Uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Michael McDonald, uh, Taylor Hawkins, uh, yeah. of course, the Foo Fighters. Ringo Starr mm. did one one track on drums. Kep Mo, great, great blues man. Bobby Rush is a, a another Chicago uh, style blues guy who is actually from Louisiana. I'm being from Texas, so I, I wasn't aware of that. Mm. Doyle Graham Hall Jr., Steve Lukather, of course, with Toto, John McPhee from the Doobie Brothers, uh, Robin Ford. And Robin, Robin and I played together in uh, Michael McDonald's first band after the Doobies, but he's another uh, just great, versatile guitarist. Yes. He played with Miles for a while, mm. played with L.A. Express, uh, Phil X who was another, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the people that Ross suggested with Bon Jovi. Mm-hmm. David Grissom, uh, who is just a great Texas-style guitar player who I wasn't aware of. My own guitarist, Doug Rappaport, that yeah. plays in my band. And uh, Tim Pierce, who's just a, a great uh, session kind of guy. But... Uh, uh, and then I mentioned Greg Bissonette on drums, Bob Bob, and Sean Hurley. So, uh, it, it just like, <laughs> I mean, there's such great uh, chemistry on that entire record. So, uh, and like, I don't normally listen, I don't like listening to my own albums. It kind of seems like that height of, uh, arrogance and self-indulgence <laughs> but yeah. this record uh, this record i mean i know it, it, it is my record uh i am the artist but it really feels more like johnny's album or something ju- that just came into existence of uh in and of itself and there are so many just incredibly great guest performances that like every time, every time I put it on, it just takes me away. Nice. And, and you know, I uh, uh, I hope you all have had a chance to listen to it. Oh yeah, Absolutely. I couldn't I couldn't take it off repeat today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's just like, uh, and you know, we haven't mentioned it yet, but it did win uh, the Grammy for best contemporary yes. blues album something which I never dreamed or expected would happen. Uh, in all honesty, I just figured uh, at my age and at this stage in my career, I'm never going to have any music uh, on the charts or uh, you know, getting airplay on radio, uh, much less like uh, winning a Grammy. Mm. And I would mentioned some of the ironies involved in you know kind of surrounding the album but i had thought that i had maybe a good chance like 50 years ago when i did frankenstein (laughs) that was number one in the nation yeah and uh and it was up for a couple of grammys uh uh didn't win them and (laughs) and uh what's the the interesting thing like johnny and i we started out as kids 
playing ukulele, singing Everly Brothers songs, and then uh, uh, we started to put together our early bands, and we, you know, the blues was our favorite. That's what I started out playing, and uh, I, well, this is not actually connected with the album, but the style of, like, I really feel like blues and jazz are the two uniquely American contributions to to music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I find it ironic that that uh, both both blues and jazz musicians are so much more highly regarded, respected uh, in Europe and uh, pretty much throughout the world, more so than right here in America, you know, where uh, both of those art forms were were born. Mm-hmm. Like I can go to, I can go to Tokyo and play the blue note as as a jazz guy, but not here, uh, not here in the states. And I think that's largely due to the fact that Frankenstein, uh, I being the first person to get the idea of putting a strap on the keyboard, uh, and that's just just such a sort of strong dynamic. Uh, uh, sort of an image that I became associated with and people think of me, I think, as a keyboard player uh, because of that. Actually, my favorite instrument is alto sax. My dad played alto sax in a swing band in in his youth. But, uh, you know, after, after... But Johnny... Johnny was the guy who... He had the drive and the ambition. And I, and part of the reason that I've made this record is because, uh, as I said, I, I certainly would not be where I am today were it not for him. I was more interested in jazz and classical, not so much in, in rock or popular music. But ever since I can remember, Johnny was going to be a star. He was Johnny Cool Daddy Winter with the pompadour <laughs> and the shades and the guitars and the girls and and uh when we started to put together bands uh Johnny would figure out the guitar parts and learn the words and then like our whole family was musical my dad played guitar banjo uh, uh played alto sax in the swing band as i mentioned he had a barbershop quartet that would come over to the house and sing my mother played beautiful classical piano my granddad played fiddle, violin. My great grandfather played trumpet, and music was just sort of a household uh, activity, something that that we grew up on. And then when we started to put together bands with our friends around the neighborhood, it's like, what? Your daddy didn't show you no chords or nothing? <laughs> we, <laughs> with a rude awakening, said, oh, this is, not everybody does this, and so. Uh, uh, since Johnny knew the guitar parts and the words, then it sort of fell to me to figure out everything else and then uh, <laughs> figure, you know, show our friends around the neighborhood how to play since none of them were really that musically inclined or knew anything about music. So that's how I became uh, so interested in, uh, like I'm a multi, I always referred to as a, as a prodigy and a multi-instrumentalist and then that and the other, which, you know, I never took that seriously. But uh, that's how that whole thing started out. But I just had this just uh, deep love of music in and of itself, just the beauty of harmony, rhythm, chords, uh, melody. Uh, I just loved music, and it was sort of my own private escape world. It was something that, that I could do that gave me a sense of identity. And uh, that was the main difference between Johnny. He reached out to the world with his music, and I sort of withdrew into my uh, own sort of introverted private world of yeah. music. And it, it sort of stayed that way up till Woodstock. Uh, and that's what really changed my life. Hmm. But getting back to the irony of, of Brother Johnny, is the, the, the thing being is we started out playing blues together, and then, like when we played Woodstock, 
that's what we were doing. We were playing blues. Then I sort of diverged, and uh, uh, I formed the band White Trash, which was like a real R and B kind of horn band, yeah. more like uh, like Sly and Family Stone, that that style. And then uh, the whole glam rock era came in, and there, there were people like uh, uh, Alice Cooper and David Bowie, and and uh, and I went off in that direction with the Edgar Winter group. And now all of these years later, I record this album that's, that really is the music that, that Johnny and I started out playing together as kids. And it wins the Grammy. And that's just such a, a interesting uh, sort of uh, full circle uh, resolution you know, and I just, uh, it gives me a beautiful feeling that, that it would happen that way. And and I know Johnny, you know, he's smiling down from blue heaven. Mm. Yeah, not bad. Not bad, little brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had uh, uh, touched upon uh, Bruce uh, Carto as the executive producer on this album. I guess, can you talk a little bit more about the two of you's working relationship. How did it all work out with you guys? Well, Bruce, uh, I mean, really, in terms, of, it was more Roth that uh, had the hands-on stuff. All Bruce basically did is just give me the freedom to do it, and he he had so much belief in the in the whole project from the very beginning. And when we first started to talk about it, he said, you know, well, I was the guy that I'd, I'd be sprawled out in the beanbag chair and, and friends come over and you, you've got a new album and you put it on and you're immersed in the, you open the package and read all the liner notes. And, uh, he, he just believed he loved Johnny's music and he said, I just, Want he said I think there's a whole generation of people out here that uh, that will remember uh, there's an older generation that will remember Johnny's music and there's a new generation that may never have heard it and uh, it just deserves to be out there in the world and uh, you know that's that's what I liked about Bruce's whole approach is uh, it wasn't uh, it was the value of the music itself that he was interested in and uh, the artistic aspects of it rather than approaching it as a business guy, you know, just to sell some records and, and, and make money. But uh, uh, one thing that Bruce did, he suggested Bobby Rush, who I wasn't that familiar with. I'd heard his name, and I, I always think of all the blues guys like... Uh, uh, like Muddy and Little Walter and Howlin' Wolf and, and uh, Willie Dixon, all that whole uh, Chicago, and I and I knew that Bobby Rush was kind of in you know in that whole circle, and then uh, when Bruce suggested, like uh, I got nearly through the album and, and realized, oh, uh, Ross said. Hey, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing by Muddy on here, mm. and I said, "Oh, you're, you know, you're absolutely right." Johnny just loved Muddy Waters, mm -hmm. and and I think the the high point of his career was getting to meet Muddy and do those records that that they did together. Uh, and I said, "Yeah, we, we've got to have something. Uh, we've got to have something." in you know to recognize and, and honor that relationship and uh i thought well mojo got my mojo working that's really like uh practically muddy's anthem yeah. and johnny and i played that song together <laughs> you know in a hundred clubs and you know thousands of times and get all they got my mojo working mm. get the, everybody to sing along with it, and I said, "Well, that's the perfect song." And uh, Bobby Rush, being a harp player, it was just it was so much like 
like uh, Muddy and Little Walter, and he was like the perfect guy to you know to to do that song. And I didn't want to sing that. I thought it should have really an authentic blues guy. And man, when I just when Bobby came in, he's like in his eighties, <laughs> and he just had so much energy, mm-hmm. like. When he started to, you know, we did the usual, like, little, little bullet mic and, and the little amp, you know, to get it to, uh, to, uh, distort the way, uh, the way those, all of those old blues recordings were done. Yes. And, uh, Ross knew exactly how to do that. Man, when he started singing it, I said, man, this is the real deal. <laughs> this is it right here. Uh, but that's a good example of, of something that, something that Bruce, uh, uh, he did once in a while, you know, come up, you know, with with uh, an idea, and uh, you know, I thank him for that. Oh, fantastic! So there you go. Fantastic. Well, with over seventeen tracks, you you start off with a rock and mean town blues uh, from the originally on the progressive blues experiment, and you you got a fitting closer with end of the line. Um, how'd you go about uh, narrowing down all the the, the track selections? Did you, did you record any extra? Do you have any extra laying around? Well, sure. The first thing I did was uh, was pick the songs, and uh, the first thing I thought, well, there are certain songs that have to be on there yeah. that Johnny is so closely associated with, uh, Rock and Roll Uchi Coo and Still Alive and Well, uh, that were written by Rick Derringer, and uh, they're classic rock songs, and uh, then... There were Johnny's original songs, like you mentioned, Mean Town. To me, like that really epitomizes Johnny's uh, early writing style, and uh, it's also a great example of something that Johnny did that I don't think he's ever really been recognized or, or received credit for, and that's his fusion of uh, blues and rock. And you know, like, there are a lot of great electric blues players like Stevie Ray, uh, you know, and the thing that Johnny did that was different was, uh, uh, like when I first heard Mean Town, when I heard that, I said, oh, it's like, it's like a John Lee Hooker, uh, slide thing, but it has this amazing energy of rock and roll. And, uh, then, uh, I'm yours and I'm hers. Yeah. Same same kind of thing. They they're based on on blues, on traditional blues riffs, but turned into into power rock riffs uh, just because of the intensity that Johnny uh, used in in doing them. And I, you know nobody really has had done that, or, and I don't think ever has really duplicated uh, that. Mm. So they were those songs. Uh, and then, like, one of the first questions in my mind was, well, do I want this just to be a straight-ahead blues record, uh, you know, uh, honoring uh, that, you know, that great legacy that Johnny left behind, or should it be more of a, a personal uh, tribute to Johnny, uh, you know, from me, from from me to my brother? And because I... You know, and based on a lot of my personal favorites, uh, and a good example of that is the song Stranger, mm. which is very uncharacteristic Johnny song, uh, kind of obscure, but it's a beautiful ballad. Yes. And, and, uh, uh, and it's probably one that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it's always been one of my favorite songs. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, the, that same thing, uh, self-destructive blues was always my favorite Johnny shuffle. Johnny did lots of like, uh, traditional blues songs like Black Cat Bone and, and, uh, uh, Dust My Broom it's by a lot of the traditional blues players. But, uh, that, that one self-destructive was always my favorite. And, uh, this brings up another good point. In picking these songs, I never associate any song with a specific artist. And okay. uh, after we decided on all the songs, 
then I started, we started looking around for, well, who, who's going to be on this? And then yeah. Ross came up with just a myriad of suggestions. But uh, when I said, well, Joe Bonamassa, I definitely want, uh, he's just like a perfect guy. Uh, and we were talking on the phone and, uh, and I was reading song list and, and then I got to self-destructive blues. Oh man, you're really going to do self-destructive. That's my favorite Johnny song. That's the first song that I learned. And I played that with my band and he just got so <laughs> excited. That's awesome. And then when he came into the session, he had like a, a firebird and, and an old, uh, 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 an old Fender Bassman amp, mm. like the same same stuff that uh, same gear that Johnny used uh, when we were kids. And man, when he st- when he started to sing, I closed my eyes and it was just like Johnny's presence mm. was in in the room. He was like uh, I think of all the guitarists, and there there are a lot of great performances. Uh, but I think that Joe came the closest to sort of channeling Johnny. And my approach to it, I didn't ask or expect anybody to play like Johnny. In other words, I didn't want to make... Uh, the idea was not to make a sound alike or a copy record. I don't generally like tribute albums uh, because of that. They end up sounding more like, like just... Uh, just cookie cutter, you know, yes. uh, knocking out the, you know, the person's uh, biggest hits and uh, most recognizable songs, and pretty much done exactly the way that that those songs were originally recorded. I did not want to do that. Uh, I wanted to get um, like not just the usual suspects, but sort of a, a varied cast of characters, and then have these people, I didn't want anybody to play a song that they didn't passionately want to play. Mm -hmm. So I let the artists pick their songs, and that, uh, like what happened with Joe was a perfect example of that. The same thing happened with Warren Haynes uh, when I mentioned Memory Pain, and he said, oh, you can stop right there, that's the one I want to (laughs) do. I love that. And that's that's, uh, more of an R&B Song and, and that uh, Johnny's not usually associated with that style. He's more of uh, either people think of him as a as an authentic blues guy or a rocker. Uh, but he had a great sense of of R and B as well. So that that then we're just talking about the songs, and then there uh, other than Johnny's originals that he wrote, there were the songs like. Uh, uh, like Highway 61, he he loved Dylan, and uh, we we played that uh, as kids. Uh, he loved the Stones, and uh, uh, what's the Stones song on oh, there? Jumpin' Jack Flash. Jumpin' Jack, yeah. Uh, uh, you know those, and he did such an incredible version of Jumpin' Jack Flash with uh, with Johnny Winter and yeah. uh, and I said that well that you know those those types of songs have to be on there. Um, so that was the way the song list developed. And then finally, I said, well, I want to, I want a couple of original songs on there. And uh, Lone Star Blues was one that uh, I had mentioned before about Johnny's drive and determination to become a star. Uh, and this is another of the ironies uh, sort of uh, uh, surrounding the album. Having worked his whole life toward that goal and finally achieving it and seemingly having everything, uh, his, you know, his dream, he had achieved it and, you know, he had uh, that same recognition, uh, respect, Adoring fans, uh, you know, great record deal, money, every everything you, uh, everything that that he had been chasing through all all that time, mm-hmm. and it 
I remember him saying, I don't, he said, it, this is just so different. It doesn't, like, uh, it, it, it wasn't the fulfillment that he expected. And he just said, you know, I just feel so isolated and alone. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's, I've created this image that everybody associates with me and uh, it's not really who I am, and I feel like uh, uh, it was like just a, a case of, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for. Yes. And uh, he he went through a period of adjustment. Uh, it was just sort of a disillusionment. And with, when I wrote Lone Star Blues, that was the feeling that because I knew that Johnny felt that way, yeah. but he had never really written a song uh, specifically about that. Like some of those ideas would creep into his lyrics, you know, from time to time. But I said, well, I'm just going to write, I'm going to write this song and I'm going to write it exactly uh, in Johnny's voice, the way, uh, I, the way I think he would have written it at that particular time. Now, that uh, uh, eventually Johnny worked through that, and uh, you know he uh, he he went into rehab, you know, and he came back stronger than ever and rededicated himself to blues. I think another uh, another thing in Johnny's career was uh, like uh, his feelings. Uh, he had ambivalence, uh, like, he loved blues, and then, like, uh, a lot of the business people, record company people, encouraged him to go in a more rock direction. And uh, there was a dichotomy there that that he found it hard to juxtapose. And for me, I, I don't, I just love all kinds of music, yeah. and I don't, I don't, I just pretty much uh, ignore all of those differences. But uh, Johnny eventually worked through that, and, you know, he, uh, uh, as I said, emerged like uh, he loved his fans, and he really, uh, he turned out, uh, like I've seen him invite people into his bus or his trailer or wherever it was, and, you know, talk, shake hands, talk to him, and, you know, sign and he, uh, he really uh, came to appreciate, you know, uh, everything that uh, his career and uh, how things turned out. But at that, at, the, you know, at that particular point, I wanted to express the way he felt. And then when I thought about the song, uh, uh, I thought, well, this has to be, once again, like uh, like Mojo, it has to be an authentic uh, blues guy, you know, to sing this song. And I knew that Ross had worked with Keb Mo, yep. you know, Taj Mahal, that Taj Mo album that won the Grammy. Uh, and I said, you know, do you think Keb Mo could, uh, you know, uh, could you talk to him for me? And so uh, Ross, he set up a phone conversation and, and I explained uh, I explained the whole thing to uh, Kevin, Kevin, uh, Kevin, actually, Kevin Morris, Kev Mo, uh, and he, he just said, well, yeah, sounds, sounds really, uh, let me hear the song. So uh, he completely broke that down. He did exactly what I'd hoped he would do. He started from scratch, and uh, he made it his song. Nice. And the thing that I love so much about that is uh, because I wrote that song entirely in Johnny's voice, but when Kevmo would come in and sing, I got the Lone Star Blues, you know, it was like, uh, it was like uh, a voice of, of compassion and understanding. Uh, it was like the old, the old blues masters, you know, talking to the, young guy saying, yeah, yeah you know, it, it can get tough, but everything's going to be all right. 
So it just introduced this, uh, brought the whole song to life for me. And uh, just that heartfelt love and compassion that wouldn't have been there, you know, were, were it not for Cap Mo. And uh, the other song that I wrote, uh, I got like toward the end of the album and I said, oh, it, this is this is great, but there's there's nothing in my own voice on like it, it, uh, all these great Johnny songs, but uh, and on every one of my albums, uh, I think of albums as sort of like a snapshot yeah. of uh, what's going on at the time and uh, how I felt, you know, about making the record and. Uh, you know the 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 last verse I think expresses that uh, uh, songs may end or just fade away, but the music never dies. Uh, stars may burn, uh, stars may shine and burn in the night. Uh, here on earth, we hear their cries. Mm. Just referring to all the people that have that have gone before, yes. uh, and uh, that's that's with the feeling that uh it's really how i feel about making the record and you know my hope that i can pass on to future generations that 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 music will live on uh and uh for, to me uh i uh another interesting thing about that particular it's not a blues song at all and i thought about doing it in a blues style but Johnny always encouraged me to follow my heart and play. The, he liked it when I when I did the entrance album, the, the, the st stuff that was more jazz and off the beaten path. Uh, and I also I think that Johnny, uh, uh, this isn't uh, brother Johnny is not the album Johnny would have made, but it, it's the album he would have wanted me to make, mm -hmm. and. That's that's all I was trying to do is to make it a real, like as honest as I could possibly do it, and uh, make it, you know, a, a, a tribute to him, but uh, you know, from me. And I and I uh, I chose to do the song that way, in the more, you know, with strings and more. Like it kind of reminds me of like when Paul McCartney did Yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, that that kind of that kind of feeling, that intimacy of, you know, just uh, Ross decided we should bring the band in on the on the last course, and that, uh, I think that was a great idea. But I like the way it, it starts out, just with piano, vocal, and strings. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's pretty much an overview. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, we, with Brother Johnny being released toward the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, did you find a renaissance in your creativity during the global lockdown? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I was just thankful to have something that I could do, to have, uh, you know, to have the home studio. It completely changed the album. Uh, when we first started, uh, my hard and fast rule was that I'm going to be there for every note that is played on this record. And oh, I was there, you know, in the beginning on every session. But with the onset of COVID, we had to start sending tracks around. And uh, uh, I didn't get I didn't get to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, amazingly, like some of the most some of the greatest, like, to me, uh, I, I wasn't there when Michael McDonald sang Stranger, and to me, that's just a magical moment yes. on that record. Mm -hmm. he, uh, and uh, when I mention my wife, Monique, uh, it's another uh, great example of how so many things uh, just, uh, I mean, the album really is just a, uh, concatenation of, of, of things, uh, as I said, it taking on a life of its own. But after we had recorded Stranger, uh, I had a scratch vocal on it. It sounded good. It sounded a lot like Johnny. And 
Monique just said, you know, this song would sound great with Michael McDonald. Mm. And as soon as she said it, like, I could just hear, like, hello, pretty stranger. <laughs> the way Michael's just this haunting, yeah. like, it, the quality, nobody sings that way. And I said, oh, man, what a great idea. And then uh, uh, I, like, I knew that Michael had moved to Hawaii, and I thought he was still in Maui or someplace, and I asked Ross, and he said, oh, I've been working, I've been working with him and John, and he, he's here. He, he just picked up the phone, called him, you know, uh, and that was so often the case with Ross. Just uh, He uh, has just recorded, you know, so many great artists. He knew everybody and just uh, was an immense help. And, uh, uh, you know, I wish I could have been there, you know, to hear that. Uh, another example of is Doyle uh, doing uh, When You Got a Good Friend. Mm -hmm. He uh, Ross was brave enough to, even during COVID, uh, he went and, and he, he captured all of those wonderful recordings and uh i was <laughs> i was locked down i was I, well, I wasn't going anywhere and uh, uh thankfully uh ross was he knew he knew the people i i, I know uh you know he would travel to wherever they were and and get the takes you know so you know, it, it it just really emerged in such an unusual it really it really is in a, in a sense like a a covid album when i when it came time to do all the horns on drown in my own tears we, uh we had to send that around to individual musicians rather than having the section and i wanted to be there i wanted to play in that horn section and direct it and do the whole thing but uh amazingly uh, uh, I think, I think, you know, even though the album was done in a peculiar way, uh, like normally you think of blues as totally spontaneous and uh, like capturing the moment. That's the way Johnny made records. This record was just, was just the opposite, but I, it has such a live feel. And I think the reason for that is because all of these people are, they're not studio players, they're band players. Right. Like everybody that played, uh, all the guest artists, uh, oh, uh, that, when, oh, this is, uh, when Warren Haynes did Memory Pain, mm -hmm. the thing that, like, he walked in, went out there, plugged in his guitar, and just did the whole song, singing, playing at the same time, and like most most people, like if you if you have somebody, if you have a guitar player come in, say, oh, well, let's lay down the rhythm track yeah. first, and then yeah. then I'll focus on the solo, mm -hmm. and then I'll go out and sing the vocal, you know. Uh, but Warren just. He plugged in and did the song, and I just thought, "Oh, man, that, this, this, that's exactly the way Johnny would have done this, just like he was playing with the old blues trio." And uh, that just impressed me so greatly. That honesty uh, of, of doing it, and when you listen to it, you can hear him kind of singing along and playing the licks. You can tell he's doing it all together. Uh, but the, you know, the, and, and I think Ross is mixing like he, he knows, uh, he, he just, uh, he's so, uh, that music is just part of, uh, it's in his blood, in his bones. It's part of his DNA. He knew exactly how to capture all of that and how to mix it to feel live. So, yeah, it was just a beautiful experience Absolutely. the way it came together. Absolutely. 
Well, well, you know, I'm a music nerd, so I, one of the things this album made me do is go back and visit your catalog and and Johnny's. I went back and listened to several songs, and um, off of uh, you talked about the white one of the white trash. I think it was the first white trash album. I think there's a song on there that I discovered that I hadn't heard before that I fell in love with. It's called uh, "Dying to Live." And, ah, yeah, and yeah. that one struck me this morning when I was listening to it. And then I discovered uh, uh, the song "Champ" by uh, Portugal, the man. Uh, that yeah, has a little but I bit just of a... did. I did that the same same time I was recording Brother Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that just came out. Can you talk about that collaboration? That was amazing. That's cool. Well, and and that was that doing that. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with Portugal, the man, and and this like. Uh, uh, there's. I don't know if you know this, but the the, connect, the dying to live connection. John, the lead singer with that band, he loved dying to live and wanted to. He he thought that that would be the perfect thing, uh, and had gotten in touch with uh, you know through management channels. And then I, I I just heard oh there's this this band Portugal the man and they they want to do a uh, part of dying to live, incorporate that into a new song that they have, and we're wondering if you would consider, you know, singing it yourself. And I said, well, uh, you know, dying to live uh, had been, you, you know, Eminem did it in the Tupac Resurrection movie, yes. which I thought was really cool because uh, at the time I I wrote that shortly after Woodstock. And uh, you know, I was explaining how how Woodstock really changed my life. In that uh, that whole thing being uh, set against the social backdrop of civil rights and the peace movement, uh, up to that point, I sort of considered myself a serious musician. Uh, I, I like jazz and classical. Thankfully, I've gotten over that. <laughs> but, uh, when uh, 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 I when I did Woodstock, like I had never played concerts. Johnny and I grew up like you know playing clubs and uh, doing the Southern club circuit, uh, and just the whole feel of the thing. When we got there, it was there's like this feeling of unity. Uh, it was as though. It was about more than than just music, uh, and when I did that performance, I had like there was no schedule. It was just organized confusion. I was dead asleep in this press trailer, and somebody shook me awake and was like, "Hey, you guys are on!" So I staggered up there uh, on stage, and we started to. Johnny would do the first part of the set with the blues trio. And now I'm going to bring home my little brother Edgar. And, you know, nobody even knew Johnny had a brother for, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for some time. And he's, oh, this is, this is a, another another guy looks just like him. <laughs> you must be twins. And uh, Anyway, uh, after I got up there, I just had this transfiguring moment. I just looked out over this endless sea of humanity yeah. and I said, wow, how how did I get here? What is this? What is going on? Uh, it, uh, it made me realize that music was not just my own little personal private escape world and that it was more than just uh, the artistic value and you know the love of uh being able to you know the how you sit for hours alone you know uh you know practicing uh the things that you know that are listening to the music from great masters that have inspired you uh but it's it's more than just music or entertainment that uh it made me realize that music really has the power to reach out and touch people in that unique way, to bring mm-hmm. people to, to uh, transcend those yeah. boundaries. 
and uh, make people like uh, you know, nobody knew that Woodstock was going to become the, the iconic symbol of you know all of that. Uh, but uh, after after doing that, that's when I started to think about what it would be like uh, to be an artist rather than just a musician that, and that I might have something to say. And Dying to Live was one of the first songs that I wrote. And I think uh, it was in part inspired by Woodstock. And I think a lot of people think of it as an anti-war song, uh, which to a degree it was. But it's really just about survival on yeah. a personal level, whether you're fighting to defend your country or just to make it one more day on the street. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and that's what Eminem, I think that was how he saw it. And I, and I thought, wow, I, I never really would have thought of it uh, in exactly that way. And so uh, anyway, it, it just like, uh, a, I I think I agree with you. I think "Dying to Live" is 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 one of my favorite songs. It may be the best song I've written. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, end of the line. I wanted to be like that. I thought I want to do it in the yeah. same kind of style as uh, as I did uh, "Dying to Live." To have that intimacy and that that sort of personal feel. But I'm glad I'm glad you went back and and discovered uh, that. Uh, I think that should be in a movie. Some, some, it should be like in the closing credits. Yeah. One of those songs yeah. you hear. Uh, but uh, I don't know if that will ever happen. <laughs> but <laughs> most, most definitely. But you know, some of our listeners might not realize uh, your involvement with David Lee Roth's uh, 1985 "Crazy from the Heat" uh, EP, uh, and you were, I believe, co-producer of that album. Correct? Is that correct? With Te- Ted Templeman? Is that right? I might have been credited with that, uh, Dave. Dave loved the song Easy Street, yeah. and he wanted to do that as part of, of uh, Crazy from the Heat, uh, and asked if you know, if I would come in and oversee the whole session and make it authentic. And I said, Yeah, sure, absolutely. And then he said, And then I got this other song here that you you only know, never heard. He was talking about Gigolo. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Are you crazy? I mean. Uh, 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 Sam Butera, you know, uh, uh, the witnesses, I think, I think that band, that Louis Prima, and the, the, to me, that's the beginning of rock and roll rather yeah. than Bill Haley yeah. and, the, and the Comets. Those guys rocked. I mean, and uh, <laughs> I knew that whole, I knew that uh, tenor sax solo uh uh, I'd heard it, and I, I thought it was so funny. Like Dave was saying, "Oh, this is an obscure song you'll never <laughs> have heard." You know. Anyway, mm. that was great fun playing that, and then California Girls, uh, and then uh, I we worked together, uh, and of course, uh, Greg Bissonette played in yeah. that great band. Mm-hmm. You know, with uh, with Diamond Dave, uh, with Billy Sheehan, and the. Uh, uh, so, that was another another point in common, mm. but uh, uh, yeah, uh, that was that was great fun. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> Do you have anything left, Jeff? I guess I want to see a follow up to to Brother Johnny with. I want I want to I want to see some of the old uh, Edgar Winter songs redone with some with some of these uh, powerhouse guys. Well, that that may or may not, <laughs> uh, and like I, you know, I hadn't made an album in. I know, so like 2008. And, and, uh, and I just, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to make an album just for the sake of having, uh, product out. Right. Uh, I made Brother Johnny, I, I felt like I, oh, it's special. I was compelled yeah. to do it. I had, I, uh, I became obsessed with it. I had to do it, uh, uh, both for for Johnny, for the fans, and for my own peace of mind, my own spiritual journey, and uh, 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 and I'm so glad that I did. And I just don't know uh, what I might do is uh, an album uh, 
there are so many great Texas blues oh, guys. Yeah. Uh, if you look like uh, Lightning Hopkins, uh, T-Bone Walker, Gate Mouth Brown, uh, Stevie Ray, of course, uh, and uh, and a lot of the songs that we did uh, uh, that were Texas people like Buddy Holly, when we started out like doing uh, Everly Brothers and Cricket songs, uh, the Sons of the Pioneers, like drifting along with the tumbling tumbleweeds. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, if I do something that might be, you know, then of course, you know, there's Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top and, uh, uh, and Stevie Ray and Johnny. Uh, so it would kind of make sense to do, uh, I think I would call it uh, Texas Tilt. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually wrote a song called Texas Tilt that would be the title song if I do that. But just, uh, 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 I think people from Texas, they have a particular mentality, uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, middle shift, or like a tilt, uh, that tilt mainly toward down toward Louisiana, uh, the part of Texas that I'm from, uh, the liquor laws were 18 as opposed to 21 in Texas, so we played in Louisiana probably more than in Texas, and uh, uh, that might be a cool album to do. Yeah, sounds like a winner. We, we're going to be waiting for it. I, <laughs> I have one last question for you, and then we'll leave you alone for the evening. I asked this question to all of our guests, uh, the mystery of rock and roll. Uh, you were a, a witness to the mystery of rock and roll back in the height of the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, with the dawning of social media, the internet, uh, there is no longer a, a mystery to rock and roll. It's lost its mystique. There is no Led Zeppelin or Kiss anymore or anything like that. For you, the artist, I guess, and also the fan of, of, of rock and roll, uh, what do you prefer, this new age of accessibility? Because if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be doing this with you right now. Or do you miss that mm-hmm. mystique that rock and roll once had? Yeah, the mystique. I, I mean, I miss. I like uh, growing up. It was uh, a total uh, mystique, a mystery surrounding. I didn't know what any of the people on the radio looked like, uh, and uh, there was a beauty to that. Uh, and they're just. It, it's just. Uh, you know, times move on, and and things change. Uh, I don't, I I don't think I could have done the album Brother Johnny if it weren't for the technology being able to, uh, with COVID having would have interrupted the middle of it. It might never, uh, certainly would have taken much longer to do. But uh, yeah, it's a it's like a double edged sword, uh, and they're like. Uh, uh, I love the fact that that I uh, have the ability to make music at home, uh, you know, real world class music, mm-hmm. and and so many people now uh, have that advantage, which never was the case. But I, at the same time, I like I had mentioned the golden eras in music and the seventies. Uh, the thing I think that made that music great was the immediacy of it like bands would uh you'd have maybe two or three songs and you'd go into the studio and actually create an album in other words you'd jam you'd exchange ideas somebody would come up with another idea oh that'd make a good bridge and then you'd (laughs) you'd go home and you'd write lyrics and the album evolved in the studio and everybody was just getting high, having a good time, and playing music, and there's nobody looking over your shoulder. Then things started to change, and there was more intervention from labels, and you couldn't even get into a studio. You'd have to do, uh, you'd have to do demos, and I, I just hated doing demos because there was. And then you try to recreate the demo in the studio, and there was always something magical about that first demo, no matter how uh, poor the quality was, that you could never just totally recapture, and I just refused to do them. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't do them. Uh, but, you know, uh, 
as I said, things change and 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 times move on, and I'm <laughs> I'm just thankful and grateful to have been there in the inception of rock and roll when all of that energy and all of that like uh that's that's not there and and I think that uh, uh a lot of the music uh like that you hear today is like great musicians just playing parts uh you know and creating uh creating songs but nobody's thinking about trying to make it sound like a band Exactly, and that's the yeah. thing that that's the thing that I miss you know, in most of the music. There aren't any real rock bands like you were like uh, like you were talking about. I mean, I guess Foo Fighters were was probably the closest thing. Uh, well, you know, there there is some, but just not not like not like it used to be. Exactly. And all those bands, the Chemistry, they they had a real personality, and you instantaneously knew who it was, uh, and. Uh, you know, but there's like so many more great singers now. Like the the whole level of like when you know, probably Ray Charles was my foremost influence, and just the soulfulness and and just the honesty and uh, of Ray's singing uh, just set a new standard. Uh, and you know, he loved. Uh, he loved jazz and gospel music, so he was a, like the perfect guy for me to identify with. And uh, uh, Larry, uh, another, uh, I think probably the most, the least understood and most overlooked element in rock and roll is uh, is gospel. I mean, gospel is the flip side of the blues, and yeah. like all the great screaming gospel preachers, singers, those, those are the people that innovated. That's where rock singing came from, and uh, you know that's what white trash was all about. Because uh, like, if you think rock and roll has energy, if uh, we used to sneak into those uh, Pentecostal tent revivals, man, <laughs> talk about <laughs> energy, uh, and you know that's uh, uh, all of that. Like, music is going to evolve, and and it's doing. It's doing what it is today, and uh, I think it's amazing that coming, you know, from where I did and having gone through all of that, uh, that I can put out something that, like I said, I never expected any of my music to be heard, and uh, suddenly here it is. I think there are a lot of, uh, I think there's still, like, whoever I never dreamed there would be a classic rock genre and people would still be talking about and listening to that music 50 years later. So, you know, it's, it's, it's still there. And, you know, I, have, I think people have a tendency to think of blues as something old. It's uh, already happened. And either they have forgotten or never really understood. Uh, I mean, to me, blues... Yeah, that's the granddaddy of all music. Blues developed into ragtime and in Dixieland and then swing and then modern jazz and then uh, found its way into rock. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's where it all came from and uh, it continues to exert a profound influence on all the music that you hear today. So... Uh, the blues is alive and well, and I think John, Brother Johnny hopefully is an example of that, and we'll uh, get people like like you guys were saying. You you, you went back and and checked out some of the early stuff. Yes. So hopefully it'll do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Evening. Is there anything that we left off tonight that you would like to promote or plug? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to be out there for. Uh, the remainder of the summer and the fall with yeah. Ringo and I his All Star Band, and we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing Johnny Be Good from uh, from the Brother Johnny album. Nice. And uh, I just want to thank all of our fans that have followed my career as well as that of my brother Johnny's throughout all the years, and it's 
meant the world to us to be able to do what we most love and see you all out there rocking and having a great time. So I, I hope to see you out there on the road. And uh, until then, don't forget to keep on rocking. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, we want to thank you for your participation. This is how things are going to work out. We're about two weeks behind on our episodes, but as soon as Jeff, the editing wizard over here, gets this all cleaned up, we'll get it to your publicist immediately. Sound good? Beautiful. Fantastic. you know, I I just kind of, uh, when I, I just kind of meander along (laughs) like a a country road and get off on tangents. You were fantastic. Uh, yeah. And Jeff and I both had to pinch each other knowing that you were going to come on the podcast. Yeah. We were so excited. Well, that's uh, And thank you all for uh, helping, uh, uh, you know, sustain the awareness and, uh, of, and keeping rock and blues, all that great music alive. Oh, fantastic. So, I enjoyed talking with you. Edgar, it was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much. Truly really an honor. You're very welcome. Have a good night, man. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Peace and love. Absolutely. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
If they ever take from you, then 